And uh, I know there are more questions, but we can move on to, uh, to our guest. Uh, if you want to start, Caroline. Well, I, I thank you very much. It was a great presentation, and I'm, I'm really impressed uh, with the whole project. Um, I, I was thinking, oh, if only we had big ideas like that more uh, here in Europe, because the, the, it's really unusual to, to still find in planning also a large vision. I think this is what sometimes we, we lack now in planning and in urban design. The, the visionary aspect and the real ambition to do something uh, at a large scale, so connective. So I, I'm very um, impressed with that. It also makes me wonder, um, is there also at the same time a kind of phasing strategy uh, connected to the project and, and some uh, flexibility? Um, and, and are you finding that that is necessary as, as the project values? Could you tell a little bit about that? Sure. Um, the project phasing, uh, answer, um, first. The, the, the project phasing is a critical component to this, partly because we don't have all the money that we need to implement at all, um, partly because the city currently only owns about half of it, the two pieces that are in the northeast and the southwest. Um, partly because the, the fact that it has multiple uh, components, the trail, typically trails are funded for a certain kind of process and transit is funded for a certain different kind of process and there are other parts and other things so the, the, the funding streams are also very important um, and also the politics of the project and the fact that the, this build, this project is believed people believe in this vision as much in the southwest as they do in the northeast. And so it's sort of unacceptable to have an idea that you would develop it in, in geographic uh, sections where it's sort of done the grid cutting and then you sort of see the first mile and you sort of work their step way around because that would mean that the other side of town wouldn't be seeing any improvements for many years. And so this idea of equitable distribution of projects Around the, around the borders so is an important part not only to the planning and implementation of the project but also to the design so that we can identify projects that can be built in the near term um, that don't compromise the ultimate build out so we don't have to tear up and replace later. Um, that's a really critical um, part of it. Um, the funding, like I said, on the east side um, for two and a half miles we're building the trail about 80% of that trail is in its final permanent um, So, for example, we have a, on one street, we have a major old freight railroad bridge that goes over the street, and we're reserving that for transit. And so we're building a new bicycle bridge um, that Jake alongside it. So for the next few years, it's going to be kind of strange that the trail is going to be jammed over to the side, and you're going to wonder what all that land over there is being used for, but you're going to know that that's where the transit is coming. Which is cool because that means that we're not going to have to tear up the trail later when we build the transit. And it also shows a significant investment in the transit because it makes the trail more expensive. It's off to the side, so it's down slope. It falls off the sort of slope of the railroad. It requires more walls and things that make it more expensive. So that's, um, that's pretty critical. Um, some of the parks um, that are opening are strategically happening in other parts of town. Um, so that those communities are getting something too. Um, there are public art projects this summer um, and last summer that happened in both of the sections of the city um, There's all kinds of events and other things. So the idea is that um, it is going to evolve into this project. It's not something that is ever sort of you know, finished and written kind of. And which is kind of exciting because the the project is so embedded and infused in the life of all these neighborhoods. So it's not a project that you can sort of draw a line around in its impact. Um, and so it's sort of just part of the city. It's fully integrated with the city. And so it's probably never actually done. The initial investment will be done uh, within the next 20 years. Um, but the, um, but you know, it will continue to evolve and change over time. I had one other thought based on your initial comment about um, being a big idea. Um, it's unusual for us to also be doing big ideas. We especially, we uh, live in a, um, a political environment where the public is very 
how they engage in the planning process about the future. Uh, there's lots of people who are concerned. They don't like the idea of change, and they don't like the idea that um, their communities may have to change in order for our city and the larger world to sort of compete in a, in a changing economy and changing global um, economy. And so, um, but, so what's amazing about the Beltline and what I think one of the reasons why it has been so successful is that um, the public really bought into this idea from early on. It is, um, they believed in it um, before um, the city leaders, before the mayor, they believed in it before uh, the developers and before anybody else really believed it was possible. And so when the city starts to make a, a decision, or whoever makes a decision about the implementation of the project that's not consistent with that original vision, um, they come out and out of the woodwork and they come out in droves just to say that's not what we said we wanted. We wanted this vision that we bought into in you know, 10 years ago, uh, which is pretty uh, amazing. It's a little bit more on that is that I don't think that if the city had come to these communities with this idea and said this is what we want to do, there's no way that the public would have bought into it. The developers had come forward and said that we think this is a great way for us to make money and you'll, I promise you'll benefit. Um, that wouldn't have worked either. But the idea that the project, the sort of kernel of the idea came from the student project at the university uh, made it believable. People could sort of trust it as a good idea and weigh the merits of it without the sort of baggage of expectations or, or assumptions about what ulterior motives the city or the developers may have. And so what I think is really powerful about uh, the universities and what students can bring to the table is um, really innovative kind of ideas and ideas that, that aren't, um, that aren't um, sort of bogged down with um, budgets and politics and other things. And you're allowed to um, envision a future that you would want for yourself and then start to figure out how um, to work through the process and make that. Uh, uh, um, so, I mean, I think that to me that's one of the coolest things about the development. And in fact, there have been a number of dozens of student projects. Um, both in the design school at Georgia Tech, um, in the preservation program at Georgia State University, in the public health department at Emory University, and a lot of other universities in the region have done projects um, that are either uh, spin-off projects from this one or um, take components of it and investigate it further. And a lot of them actually work with the different communities um, to see <coughs> what, they would, um, what they would want to see. And then those projects, a lot of them end up in the neighborhoods plan for themselves. And then that filters back into the city's official uh, planning process. And so the Southern planning process that I mentioned um, began actually with um, uh, three uh, design studios at Georgia Tech uh, that looked at the street framework and how you would implement a new street framework for those industrial tracks. That is now a, a, um, a document that's adopted by the city. Um, and has morphed into a larger sort of land use. So there's lots of ways that that's just been. I have one additional uh, question. Um, because, uh, so for when will the transit actually be uh, realized? Because this is really interesting also related to the question, is it uh, about the relation between the transit related or oriented right. development? Sure. Because the risk, of course, when you have already implemented so many other things, is that then we will say, well, we obviously don't need to transit now, and <laughs> so much has already been done. Well, a lot of the development would come without the transit, for sure. People moving back to the city, um, it's fairly easy to get in there and get an industrial piece of property and something for that kind of new density. Um, it absolutely would come. Um, the, the big problem, of course, is sort of what you're going to think that where you can't ask the developers to reduce the parking um, if there's no transit. But you can't, the way the funding mechanism works, it's hard to build the transit without the money that is provided by the development for that tax district. Unfortunately, um, in, our, um, uh, in our region, we don't, we don't have a lot of money to invest in the transit. Just to be the, the mayor has committed to making this thing happen in 10 years, not 20. And I, I, I think that that's possible. Um, but it's going to take a larger commitment um, in terms of getting that transit money ahead of time. Um, related to that, of course, is that right now, um, and on the ballot for next uh, summer, will be uh, a 
sales tax that would fund transportation projects in the region. And the Beltline, as it currently stands, has uh, $600 million in that um, to fund transit for the Beltline. So if it passes, and that's in the bid, I don't know if it will. Um, but if it does, it would mean we would start implementing transit within three years on the eastern and on the western sides of the border. And once that's done, then we can definitely be our local match. We can get uh, additional federal money uh, matched for that. And we can start to see the transit in and Atlanta, like I said, I mean, we had streetcars everywhere. We had 300 miles of them. We got rid of them in the 1940s. Um, I think that when you start to see them again, and so people can see them and experience them and live them, that is going to build up to a lot more momentum. And it's going to be a lot easier to start moving that part of the project once we get something done. So the critical thing is to start to see Thank you. Dominic, if you want to react. <laughs> well, thank you again, um, Ryan, for your inspiring presentation. Like Roberta said, I think a lot of you could be inspired by relatively small beginnings to a scheme like this, which has a huge amount of potential and, uh, and, um, and a long way to go uh, in the future. It could really uh, change things a lot for the, for the, the city. Um, Roberta asked me to give some reflections, um, which I'm quite happy to do. Um, I'm going to talk not from a design perspective, I'm not a designer. I am more interested in governance, the issues of policy making. Um, and I guess one of the reasons why Roberta asked me is because my background is in the relationship between land use policy and transport policy and how these come together and how these interact and um, in fact my master's thesis and my PhD were both on, on these subjects but of course they didn't have any kind of level of impact like um, this graduation thesis did that Ryan wrote unfortunately but anyway um, one of my interests these days is about policies and policy ideas and, uh, and how they move and how they, how they get transferred and how they change and how they evolve, how they develop in one place and they get picked up by other people and they get transferred to other locations, to other contexts <coughs> and, um, and how they take root and often, and often they take root in different ways and they 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 get um, they get changed along the way, and that's something that interests me here in this particular case, because um, well for two reasons. The, f the first is um, the evolution of the, the transit-oriented development concepts. Now, some of you may have this idea that TOD is a purely North American <coughs> concept. It's a purely North American idea, but if you trace things even further back, and I'm by no means uh, an expert in planning history, um, but I know enough to say that the roots of TOD are not in North America, but here in Europe, and we can see evidence of transit-oriented developments uh, in uh, the, the, the cities of um, Northwest Europe right now. Um, we can look at development that took place in the late 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, and much of that development was transit oriented. Development took place along rail lines, it took place along tram lines, it took place along metro lines. Um, and that was because it was uh, a dominant mode at the time. Co ownership was very low. Um, this was a new technology and it was really driving uh, the development of, of land. Um, and I think when we look at the lessons of TOD, we don't necessarily have to look at the lesson from North America for, um, for where we can draw inspiration. We can also look back in history to how things developed closer on our doorstep as well. And we, I don't think we should lose sight of of, of these ideas either. Um, so that's just kind of taking the, uh, the, the, uh, 
the, the origins of theory and further thinking about the movement of, of some of these ideas. I was also, also quite interested to, to hear the small anecdote that, uh, that Ryan was giving of his experience in Paris. Okay, Northwest Europe, one of the places where transit oriented developments took place at the end of the 19th century, inspiring Ryan to go back to Atlanta and then <coughs> developing some of these ideas which evolved, which changed, which were adapted to a very different context and have resulted in some of these ideas which, which you saw this morning. What I'm also interested, uh, was also interested to hear in uh, Ryan's presentation was um, how the specific ideas that he proposed in his graduate project really took root in the city of Atlanta. And I guess if you want to put a social science explanation on this, then you can use theories like, uh, like uh, John Keegan's multiple streams model and say this was a very good example of where different policy ideas, uh, problem uh, uh, ideas or problem streams, and political ideas came together. There was a confluence of, uh, of these different ideas which meant that uh, this scheme went forward because there was this window of opportunity um, related to a political problem uh, uh, policy ideas which came together at a certain point in time and I think this is also, this is also an important thing to, to kind of think about when it comes to explaining why something happens like this in a particular place and yet in other places it doesn't, or it might not. You know, the, it just could be that the circumstances weren't right. Uh, and, but in this case, the circumstances were right. Um, now, if you want to kind of take this uh, explanation further, then you can say, okay, in terms of the, the problem stream, in the particular case of Atlanta, um, there were particular problems related to dereliction along these routes about um, underused uh, land and underused buildings which were ripe for redevelopment. At the political level, I don't know enough <coughs> to say a lot about this, but one of the things that I mentioned was a, a specific politician who was very interested in the project, who got elected, who then took things forward. So from the political stream, you've also got the, the right conditions, you've got the, the confluence of, of, of things coming together, um, which helps the process. And then in terms of the policy streams, Ryan has also mentioned the tax rating, the, the new tax mechanism, which also came about and came together with these other things, which allowed this process to take place. So you've got all these different things <coughs> providing a very specific window of opportunity to allow this vision to be implemented. And I think this is, uh, this is uh, uh, fascinating from that, that perspective. Finally, going back to the inspiration thing, I would say this is a really positive message for all of you, for all of us, that we can all make a difference. That whatever stage of our careers, whether it's at the beginning or the end, uh, many of you are at the beginning, these ideas that you come up with in your research and, and your studies can make a difference. They aren't necessarily going to get consigned to the archives of the university. With a bit of luck, with a window of opportunity, um, with the right connections with some, some realism and vision, <coughs> your ideas can also make a difference. Thank you.
across your project by, by some form of chance, um, a luck you might call it. Um, <coughs> We have a sort of regular newsletter where we, from which we sort of try to put together different ideas around the world or in the Netherlands and, and, and redistribute them to um, whoever uh, is willing to uh, to read this uh, uh, little point. And somehow your project sort of ended up in, in there, and, and and we got so inspired by it, uh, even though the context is so very different. And then it is in the Netherlands, and I think uh, the lecture you gave proved that it is, it's indeed inspiring, even though we know all of the differences that are there. Um, I would like to to ask you a little bit about um, some sort of critical moments in the process of the development of this project. I was involved um, uh, a couple of years ago in a in a project uh, which is called Stedebaan. Um, which is indeed in the southern part of the Landstad trying to um, intensify the use of the existing railroad uh, structure uh, and at the same time uh, reorienting the, um, the, sort of the growth of the cities towards the places around these stations. Um, and um, there are some, a lot of similarities in the story that you're telling and, uh, and, and sort of the, um, the road that we took in order to develop this project and the different components that, uh, that are part of it. So one of the first sort of critical issues I'm, 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 I'm wondering about is this question of um, the division between, the, let's say, the grassroots or the, or the people who are really the, the stakeholders um, as, uh, against the institutionalization of the project, there's always a sort of danger that that it's that it's either one way where it's just a sort of very local uh, grassroots uh, development that goes up and down, and uh, in in the end is just a sort of fragmented thing and never becomes something bigger. And on the other hand, there's the danger that. Um, that it's taken over by the big institutions, especially in the Netherlands, it's just like, well, the government will take care of it, and, and actually nobody owns the project anymore, and then at a certain point also it changes. So I think it's interesting to, to hear your reaction on that sort of division and how to keep the balance in there, and, and how to keep going. But the second part, uh, it's a sort of same kind of critical point I have a feeling, is the division between the central idea or the vision, sort of the thing that, that keeps you moving forward, which is in effect a very simple idea. Um, and, the, and all of the components that are coming out of that, so basically uh, the trail, for instance, in the Atlanta Beltline project, the trail is a very important point, and the parks, which you might not necessarily immediately connect with uh, Development as such, but I think are very sort of integral parts of the uh, of the idea at a certain moment. But how is the division between the, the components and the and the big idea? How do you do you keep the balance? And finally, I, I'm I'm wondering um, already from the start actually, it's such an interesting project, it's such an inspiring project. I mean, who could be against such a thing? So that's also interesting. For here that obviously there, there, there are a lot of um, uh, struggles you're, you, know, you have to, to battle. Um, but I'm wondering who and how, how does it look? Okay, I'm not sure that uh, multiple questions, so you may have to remind me if I forget, but I'll try to answer. The first two are, I think, very um, related. Um, uh, I think that part of the strength of the project is that it has so many different and um, there was a point where it became quite obvious that um, you don't implement a project like this with a grassroots movement. <laughs> you know, um, it needs an entity, it needs the sort of validation of the city and the confidence of the city um, or another entity to sort of begin implementation. Um, but, because, um, but because the project has so many components, then, then the, the public entity also has several different 
components. So there's the city, uh, which controls uh, urban planning, um, parks, uh, public works, streets, those kinds of things. Um, there's the transit authority, which is a totally separate entity uh, that is studying transit. Um, and then there's all kinds of stakeholder groups and other uh, forms of implementation. So over time, um, you know, we had to talk about um, we had to talk about those issues sort of individually. So we had to, there was a point where we were talking about transit, especially when we were looking at the feasibility of transit, where we go, what kind of train is it? Are we talking about fast trains that stop infrequently or slow trains that stop a lot? And making sure that that piece of it was part of the vision. And there was a point at which, at least one point at which, it felt like the project was going to be taken over by transit, and it was all about transit, and all these other things were going to get to the wayside. Um, but because you had such a broad constituent group that also loved the project because of uh, green space, or economic development, or whatever other angle people love it for, um, they were always at the table. And so they were always reminding everybody that, you know, that's transit's important, but it also has to be these other things. Similarly, when we went through the redevelopment plan that approved the tax district, um, it felt like the whole city was going to get overrun with uh, development, with condos and retail, that the transit wasn't really ever going to get built, that the parks were just going to disappear. Um, but because the transit advocates and the parks people were always at the table also at those meetings, it helped balance um, the conversation. Um, and, and so the, the competing um, complementary, the competing kind of interests always seem to balance each other, both in sort of the sense of the vision for the project and, and the public sort of buy-in and, and demand to build it, um, but also in the different agencies are required to implement it. Um, because the constituent group is so broad, it always seemed to balance the conversation such that nobody could ever really take it over and implement it in a way that was not consistent with the original vision. It was fairly balanced. Um, and so uh, the other thing that helped was that the primary entity um, that now was charged with building the project um, didn't exist in the early days. So we, that entity is called Atlanta Bellman Inc. Um, they're uh, sort of a part of our economic development agency, but um, they have their own board and the mayor's own board. But it was created, that organization was created solely to build this project, but it was created after much farther along the process. So their charge is to build the vision that everybody has sort of wanted to, which includes all of these different components. And they have their board representation, um, has full um, uh, spectrum of the constituent groups of, of all these different angles. Um, they also have a, a citizens um, advisory committee that sort of will watch the make sure that they're doing that sort of full balance. So, um, there's a very deliberate attempt to make sure that um, all those different voices are represented in the implementation agency. Um, and then, of course, like I said, any time they were, if they were to veer off in any direction, the, way, um, the public would come out in full force. And, uh, so, um, I'm not sure if I answered your first question. Uh, yeah, I think both. I think both, both first. So there's the. I didn't <coughs> Who doesn't like the project? Um, uh, it's, it's really funny because um, either people who, um, I'm sure there are people who don't like the project. I don't, I don't know who they are. But I know that they are. I know that there must be some. But it's interesting because the, pub, because the public generally loves the project so much, um, people who don't like it for whatever reason don't feel like they can stick their neck out and say that they don't like it. And so even when we had our uh, mayoral election um, a couple of years ago, um, you could not be a viable candidate for mayor and not have some plan for how you were going to implement the development faster and better. Um, and so that, um, the, again, the public support, that grassroots effort pays off in the long run um, to make sure that the implementation of the project through multiple um, uh, election cycles can also support. Um, the, the, and, and then any sort of, um, and there has been certainly 
um, some voices who, uh, who were concerned about the project, who had some concern about it. Um, like gentrification is probably um, the leading um, uh, challenge that we've had to find an answer to. And again, the economic climate has offered us some time to do that. Um, I'm not sure that our what the answers that we have um, answer all of those sort of problems, but they certainly do more than anything else has been done in the States. And, and, and there's still time that we're still working on it. Um, but it was always interesting also that the people who had a problem or were concerned about gentrification, the first thing they, they would say was, um, we love the Beltline, we think it's great, we think it would be great in these communities, but we're concerned about gentrification. So it was never really about the project, it was about how the project was implemented um, and what the impacts of it would have on the communities and whether those concerns were addressed. Um, even right now, uh, I mentioned the state uh, tax that will be on the ballot next summer um, for a region of five million people where the city is urban core, all of the development is all within that urban area, um, is only one tenth of that regional population. The Beltline has one of the highest uh, numbers, probably, you know, um, funding numbers in that in the, in the list of projects for the region. And it's been determined to be a regional project because it changes the way that people live, which is a much more effective way of reducing congestion than trying to reach new transit lines out to and so on. Um, and so, uh, but even then, so some of the old, other folks in other far, farther out parts of the region um, are concerned that the development has such a um, high number in that project list. Um, but when they come to say, hey, they, the first thing they say is, we think the development is great and it's going to transform it and it's really important, but we're concerned about the amount of money that is being allocated relative to the rest of the region. And so it's, it's interesting that um, even the even the naysayers of the project that's always been sort of couched in this idea that it's a great project. We just concerned about how it's implemented, and then as long as the city can address the way that it's implemented, and address those concerns, then they're really there really aren't that many voices out there that um, say much negative about it. Well, yeah. I think we have a, a, a bit of space for more.